All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for joining us for our monthly Date with History series here at the First Division Museum at Cantini Park. Um, this is our second presentation for the year, and I am so excited because 2022 is the 15th anniversary of the Date with History series. Can you believe it? I know some of my regulars are in the audience. Can you believe we have been doing this for 15 years? So exciting. Um, before we get started this evening, this is your final reminder that tonight's presentation utilizes closed captioning. I know you've all heard me say it before. You can go ahead and take one final look at the screen and that will give you the instructions on how to change or turn those off. Before we get started, everyone, let's go over what are some of the upcoming programs for the First Division Museum and Cantini Park. And of course, I always like to start off with talking a little bit about um, the Date with History programs, sister program. If you like the Date with History, you are going to love Headlines from History. That is brought to us by the Robert R. McCormick House and Headlines from History explores exciting headlines from the Chicago Tribune. Um, but this month, we are taking a little bit of a sidestep to that. And rather than talking about an exciting headline, we're going to talk about an exciting person from history. And that is Miss Edith Rockefeller McCormick. Now, for my friends who are joining us from the Chicagoland area, if you are not familiar with Miss uh, Edith Rockefeller McCormick, she is quite the character um, in the Chicago socialite scene. And if you haven't enjoyed a beautiful day with your family at Brookfield Zoo, we have Edith to thank for that. So learn more about that exciting story and our Thursday, March 24th program at 7 p.m. online via Zoom. Of course, that presentation is done by my coworker and friend, Chris Corgan. And we are gonna be talking with um, author Andrea Federici Ross, whose book, new book is out right now. There was a great review of it in the Chicago Tribune. And that is Edith the Rogue Rockefeller McCormick. I know I'm tuning in for that one, I wanna learn more. And of course, we have to talk about one of our next month date with history. So next month's date with history, we are back to our regularly scheduled date and time, the first Thursday of the month at seven. So that will be Thursday, April 7th at 7 p.m. Central Time, when you set online via Zoom. And that is going to be Danger Forward, The Forgotten Wars of General Paul F. Foreman. And this book is jam packed with really interesting stories about uh, General, retired four-star General Paul F. Foreman, who served with the 1st Infantry uh, Division with the 26th Infantry Regiment of Spaders. So please come and join us in that one. That history is going to cover so many fascinating topics. We're going to talk about the Vietnam War, the Pentagon Papers, Operation Urgent Fury, and more. And there's, I could go on, but I don't want to spoil that one. We're going to be having that presentation with um, Mr. Mike Guardia. So please join us on April 7th to learn more about that. And just a final reminder, if you are so excited about what you learned tonight, I want to encourage you to pick up the author's book. And you can do that by coming here to Cantini Park and visiting our gift shop. In our gift shop right now, we have both of these months uh, for Headlines from History and Date with History's books in the gift shop. So please stop by and pick up your copies. All right, everybody, let me get this off here. All right, before we get started, I just want to quickly go over some of our house rules. Those of you who have been here before, this won't take too long. Um, if you have questions, we're going to be saving the last 15 minutes of the presentation tonight for Q&A. And you can get those questions to us by using the question and answer feature button at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it's the top, but this time I believe it's on the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and submit questions to us. That way we'll be getting to them. And I will get to as many of those questions as possible. We have very enthusiastic guests who ask us tons of questions, which we love. Um, but I will do my best to get to as many of them in the time allotted. Also, we have not in the past had any technical issues of greatness during our presentations, so we are not anticipating any this evening. But should something happen and we have some technical problems, we just appreciate in advance that you guys give us a little bit of grace as we navigate through that problem. Not anticipating it, but you know, you got to say it so we don't have it. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, I want to welcome our Illinois State teachers again who are joining us this evening for our professional development program with teachers. We're excited to share this story with you and maybe with your students, so we're real excited. But that being said, I want to welcome our presenter tonight. Um, her name is Amy Butler Greenfield. She is an author and she has written about history and art and science and our topic this evening, spies. I'm so excited, everybody. Um, Elizabeth, so tonight we're gonna hear her speak about a code-breaking pioneer, Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Uh, Greenfield's work has been published in nine languages and she has appeared on radio and television, including one of my favorite shows, uh, PBS's The American Experience. She has also given popular talks at the International Spy Museum, the Los Angeles Public Library, and UK Intelligence Agency, the Government Communication Headquarters. Everybody, I am so excited. So please, on behalf of everybody, we're gonna give a rounding <laughs> welcome and applause to Ms. Amy Greenfield. Amy, I'm gonna pass it on to you, but before I do so, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time and burning the midnight oils for us. Ms. Greenfield is joining us all the way from London this evening virtually. So thank you for joining us so late in the evening for you, um, almost morning. And I'm so excited to share this story with our guests because a lot of the action is going to take place really close to where I am at Cantini Park. So has some great local history, everybody. So that being said, Ms. Greenfield, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Laura. And thank you to the First Division Museum for inviting me to speak tonight. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm really delighted to be able to speak to you tonight. I want right now, um, right at the beginning, to go ahead and share my screen with you because I have lots of really wonderful images um, and photographs um, from the Friedmans themselves that I want to be able to share with you tonight. So as you've just heard, I'll be talking today about the hidden life of codebreaker Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Her extraordinary career began in 1916, and by the late 1930s, she was one of the most famous codebreakers in the world. Yet her success was hushed up and later she was pushed into the shadows of history. For over half a century, she was almost completely forgotten. Even to those in the know, she was overshadowed by her husband, William Frederick Friedman. One of the most famous code breakers in history, he was the man in charge of the team that solved the Japanese cipher purple in 1940, and he was a key special advisor at the National Security Agency in the 1950s. He's sometimes called the Dean of American Cryptology and the Godfather of the NSA. For decades, many people assumed that William Friedman was the only brilliant codebreaker in the family. But Elizabeth was brilliant too, as a William himself was always quick to point out. They had a long and happy marriage, but they rarely worked together. Elizabeth Friedman's achievements were her own. Recently, Elizabeth Friedman has finally started to receive her due. She's been the subject of full-length biographies, a picture book, many articles, and an American Experience documentary. More projects are in the works. So what is left to say? Quite a lot, as it turns out. She was a woman of many secrets, and that secrecy has given rise to some misconceptions and myths about her life. Today, I'm going to share some of what I've learned about the hidden side of this woman who achieved so much. Let me take a moment and make sure that our slides are advancing. It often takes a moment or two to respond. There. Yeah. Elizabeth Smith was born in 1892. She was the ninth and last surviving child of John and Sophie Smith who farmed just outside of Huntington, Indiana. She didn't like to talk much about her childhood. And this is one of the few images we have of her back then. She is the tiny girl in the front. She's sickly and small for her age. Her father was a domineering man and he and Elizabeth didn't get along. Her mother Sofa is often portrayed as a shadowy figure with a limited outlook. But I found records that show this simply isn't true. 
Like her daughter, Sofa had a curious mind. She had gone to one of the best academies in Indiana, and she was once a school teacher. She was Elizabeth's champion, and she was almost certainly the reason why Elizabeth aimed at going to college, a rare ambition in those days. My mother encouraged me to go my own way, Elizabeth once said. And this is the Smith family farmhouse, where Elizabeth spent most of her childhood. It's often said she was raised as a Quaker. It makes a good story, the Quaker turned code breaker. But in fact, her family attended the local church of God, not Quaker meetings. What the Smith family did have were Quaker ancestors on her father's side. He was proud of this and so was she. She applied to Quaker colleges because she hoped this would win over her father who did not approve of higher education for women. Unfortunately, she didn't get in. When she graduated from high school, she told people she was college bound. In reality, she was stuck at home. Here's a photo of her that was taken around this time. For Elizabeth, this year at home was a lost year and she tried to make it disappear. For decades afterwards, she always subtracted exactly one year from her age as if to say this extra year at home didn't count. To make everything add up, she put a false birth year on her official documents. Even her future husband wouldn't learn the truth till they had been married for many years. During that year at home, Elizabeth found the grit to apply to college again. This time she got into a non-Quaker one and she managed to persuade her father to lend her the money to go. He drove a hard bargain, demanding she pay back every penny at 6% interest. But to Elizabeth, it seemed a price worth paying. At college, she studied English, languages, and philosophy. In 1915, she earned her BA. She also became engaged to a younger student, a poet named Harold Van Kirk. While he continued his studies, she hoped to get a job in business, but she had no luck there. Instead, she got a job in teaching because that was one of the only professions open to educated women in 1915. The pattern of her life seemed set, but not for long. That year, she discovered that she hated teaching, that her relationship fell apart. Although she didn't know it, that last bit was a lucky break because Van Kirk turned out to be a nightmare for the women who did marry him. In 1916, however, the end of the relationship threw Elizabeth into deep despair. She feared she would spend her life all alone, chained to jobs she hated marking papers and marking time. She wrote in her diary that she wished passionately day after day only to die. Desperate for a fresh start, she took a train to Chicago to search for another job in late May, 1916. After pounding the pavement, she stopped at the city's famous Newberry Library, which had a first folio, that is a first edition of Shakespeare's plays printed in, in 1623. She impressed a librarian there who made a phone call to a possible employer. Minutes later, a huge man with a bellowing voice strode in. Before Elizabeth knew what was happening, he had swept her out of the library. They boarded a train headed for a place called Riverbank. The man's name was George Fabian. You can see him standing here with Elizabeth. He was a millionaire and Riverbank was his estate. It was located in Geneva, Illinois, about an hour west of Chicago, and roughly 10 miles or so west of where the First Division Museum stands today. If you go to Geneva, you can still see the Fabian Villa and its Japanese garden, but in Elizabeth's day, Riverbank was far more extensive. The estate stretched over some 300 acres and it had staff from all over the world. A lighthouse flashed the warning 23 skidoo in Morse code, turn of the century slang for get lost. In the main house, the chairs, sofas and beds swayed in mid air, suspended by chains from the ceilings. A chimpanzee named Patsy lived on the porch. What was most unusual about Riverbank, however, was its research program. You can see a bit of evidence of that again, if you go to visit it today, but again, it was quite extensive at the time. Fabian had used his millions to found a one of a kind 
think tank. And as a result, Riverbank was home to experts of all kinds. Fabian's pet project was run by a gracious woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup, and it involved Shakespeare. Gallup was studying the first folio and the variations in its letters. You can see examples of those subtle variations here. Gallup was convinced that these variations served a purpose, that they were a cipher carrying secret messages in Shakespeare's plays. She needed a new assistant and Elizabeth got the job. Here she is with Gallup and Gallup's sister, Kate. Elizabeth is on the left and it's Kate Wells and Elizabeth Wells Gallup. Elizabeth loved Shakespeare and she loved learning more about codes and ciphers. She also enjoyed everyday life at Riverbank, which included swimming, fine dining, and late night joy rides in a fancy sports car. Yet no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't confirm any of the secret messages that Gallup claimed to have found. At first that made Elizabeth feel like a failure. Then she began to wonder if maybe Gallup was seeing messages that weren't really there. For a while, Elizabeth kept her doubts to herself. Fabian had a temper and he didn't like to be crossed and she couldn't afford to lose her job. After a while, however, she confided in another Riverbank employee, a young scientist named William Friedman. You can see him sitting next to her in this photo at Riverbank. Thanks to Elizabeth, William started taking an interest in cryptology. He also took an interest in Elizabeth. Both would turn out to be lifelong passions. Later in life, when asked how he became a codebreaker, William had a succinct reply, I was seduced. The more Elizabeth and William saw of the Shakespeare project, the more they became convinced it was nonsense. They were absolutely right, but when they finally confronted Fabian, he was furious with them. Then Fabian decided he had bigger fish to fry. He ordered them to set up a department of ciphers at Riverbank, and he offered their services to the army, just as America was entering World War I. Back then, the United States had hardly any good code breakers. So Elizabeth and William ended up leading the country's main US-based code breaking unit. They were only in their mid twenties, but they were responsible for decrypting secret messages, not only for the army, but also the State Department, the Justice Department, the Navy, and even the Post Office. Later in the war, they also created the Army's main code-breaking school, and they did all of this from Riverbank. Working as a team, Elizabeth and William spent hours together day after day. After a month or so of this, they eloped. Here they are on their wedding day, looking rather overwhelmed. There was strong family opposition to the match, chiefly on religious grounds. William's family was Jewish and hers was not. But they went ahead anyway, marrying in a Chicago synagogue. William adored Elizabeth, and he declared himself as early as December 1916, when Elizabeth had a dangerous attack of appendicitis. For Elizabeth, the prospect of marriage was more complicated. She had seen too many women trapped in unhappy marriages. And after her devastating experience with her fiance Van Kirk, she didn't trust herself to love anyone again. So even though she considered William her dearest friend, to marry him was a gamble. It was only after the wedding that he won her heart. It helped that William truly wanted a marriage of equals, a very unusual idea at the time. It also helped that when they worked together, something magic happened. Attuned to each other to an almost spooky degree, achieved things that others considered impossible. Amazingly, the two of them could crack almost any message within two hours. Elizabeth loved the moment when the solution emerged. The skeletons of words sleep out and make you jump, she once wrote. But there was trouble on the horizon. The war that had brought William and Elizabeth together was about to split them apart. In 1918, William was sent to France to serve as a code breaker near the front lines. Here he is with Elizabeth just before he went overseas. Female code breakers weren't allowed to serve outside the US, so Elizabeth couldn't join him. Alone at Riverbank, she was harassed by Fabian, who also prevented her from getting a code breaking job 
in Washington, D.C. Instead, he insisted she return to the Shakespeare Project. She took the only option left to her, and she went home to look after her widowed father. By the end of the war, William was seen by the army as a code-breaking genius, and he really was one. Soon he was writing papers that would transform the foundations of cryptology. Recently, it's been argued that Elizabeth was a secret co-author of many of these papers. While there's strong evidence that she helped with the earliest ones, it's also clear that the later and most remarkable papers, including a truly revolutionary work called The Index of Coincidence, came from William alone. But that shouldn't surprise us. While William was in France, wrestling with some of the world's most difficult codes, Elizabeth was back in Indiana cooking and scrubbing floors for her father. There, as she later put it, she began to realize what it meant to be a champion swimmer stranded in the Sahara. By the end of the war, her co-breaking skills had atrophied, and she was known mostly as William's wife. As you can see here, Elizabeth was overjoyed when William came home from France in 1919. Yet when it came to code-breaking, she knew she had fallen behind him. She did not see how she could ever catch up. It was, she wrote, an altogether hopeless prospect. At the end of 1920, the War Department offered them both jobs in Washington, D.C., but Elizabeth was hired essentially as William's assistant for half the pay. After a year on the job, she quit. There's been speculation about why, but I found the answer on a scrap of legal pad that's buried in a pile of miscellaneous papers in her archive. She resigned, she wrote, in the hope of having a child. At the time, that's what many women did when they wanted children, but it didn't work out for Elizabeth. When the hope for a baby didn't materialize, she took a job with the Navy, only to fall ill almost immediately with severe morning sickness, the first sign of what would be a very complicated pregnancy. She had to give up the job, but she and the baby survived. Here's a photo of her with her husband and daughter. Over the next few years, as she endured periods of ill health and had another baby, she undertook jobs she could do at home, some private code work and drafting a book on code breaking for amateurs. What pulled her back into full-time code breaking was prohibition, or to be more precise, the Coast Guard's battle to enforce it. Elizabeth wasn't anti-alcohol, but she believed the law was the law. And like many Americans, she was shocked by the links between rum running and organized crime. Gangsters had quickly taken over the rum running racket. And by 1924, some $500 million a year in illegal booze was entering the US. The profits made it easy for the gangsters to run rings around law enforcement and violent crime soared. Outmanned and outgunned by the rum runners, the Coast Guard's only hope was to outsmart them by decrypting their radio messages. These revealed when and where the illegal cargoes were being transferred and landed. But the gangsters' radio networks were vast. This diagram from Elizabeth's archive shows how complicated they could be with many different vessels, channels, and code types. The word black in this diagram that you'll see is a reference to ships that were out there without lights. Um, and you can see the headquarters, the shore stations. It's a big network and this is only part of it. The Coast Guard knew it needed a top-notch cryptographer. They offered the job to Elizabeth because they believed her husband would help her with the work. They had no idea that Elizabeth by herself was up to the job, but they soon learned. In just over three years, working almost entirely on her own, Elizabeth solved a staggering 12,000 secret messages for the Coast Guard and its allies. This gave the Coast Guard a big advantage, but the gangsters fought back by hiring some of the best cryptographers in the business at about four times Elizabeth's salary. By, the late, 19, uh, by late 1930, Elizabeth estimated that she had seen nearly 50 distinct systems of secret communication. She cracked all of them, a remarkable feat only to see even more challenging ones take their place. Day after day, she was forced to grapple with them alone. It was demanding work. At times it seemed nearly impossible, but it was the making of her. Just as her husband's skills had grown by leaps and bounds while he was overseas in France, 
Elizabeth's talents were now undergoing a similar transformation. Month by month, she honed her talents until she stood once more in the vanguard of the field. When the government started using her as an expert witness in Rum Runner trials, Elizabeth became famous. Here she is on her doorstep on her way to court in 1934. What really put her in the public eye was a case in which a lawyer for the Capone family repeatedly questioned her expertise. Finally, Elizabeth turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, is there a blackboard available to the court? When a blackboard was brought forward, Elizabeth gave everyone a lesson in the basics of cryptanalysis. To her surprise, the blackboard story set the press on fire. Articles about Elizabeth appeared all over the country with bold headlines and photos. And throughout the 1930s, the interest continued. Here's one of the many newspaper clippings she saved. After prohibition ended, crime bosses began to smuggle drugs instead of rum. Elizabeth kept up the chase. Her biggest code-breaking challenge came in 1937. It involved a set of secret messages that were seized from a Vancouver shop owned by a millionaire named Gordon Lim. The Canadian Mounties suspected Lim of drug smuggling, but they had no proof. When they couldn't crack the messages, they passed them to Elizabeth. The 17 messages were all very short and written in five letter combinations. The Mounties suspected the plain text, the original message was in Cantonese. By then, Elizabeth was in charge of a small team of code breakers. Together, they worked out that the messages belonged to four different systems. They even managed to break part of the encryption, turning the letters into numbers. They guessed too that the messages were meant to be used with a Chinese code book like this one. Then they got stuck and everyone but Elizabeth gave up. To be able to break very short messages is one of the most difficult things to do as a code breaker. And to break those messages in many different systems was even more complicated. It made sense for her team to give up. But Elizabeth kept taking them out and one day she selected, as she put it, three messages, which for some intuitive reason, I believe might end with a character for a reply. Her intuition had always been remarkable and after a decade of breaking thousands of messages every year, it was now second to none. In those three messages, she spotted several patterns. She discussed them with a young Chinese linguist who questioned some of her results saying they made no sense in Cantonese. But Elizabeth had an idea. I asked her to speak the Chinese words together so I could hear if the sound made sense to me, she later said. The syllables that it linguist spoke were ix and chun. And to Elizabeth, they sounded like iction, the name of a vessel owned by a company that had been involved in drug trafficking before. Now she was sure she was on the right track. Soon she had all the messages cracked. They bloomed like flowers, she later said. And they proved beyond doubt that Gordon Lim was guilty. After his trial in 1938, she made headlines all over the world. Here is a typical article which appeared in the Christian Science Monitor, very much the facts. Here's a rather more lurid account how the G2 woman trapped the dope ring. Most accounts of Elizabeth will tell you she hated publicity, but the truth is more complicated. She never approved of articles that messed with the facts or that commented on her appearance, but often she saved them anyway. And for many years, she was happy and sometimes eager to talk with responsible reporters. She appeared on radio. She told a publisher she wanted to write a memoir. She actively searched for co-authors who could help her write a book about her adventures. But the more publicity she actually got, the more she came to dislike it and the more difficulties it posed for her. Once World War II was on the horizon, her new top secret duties meant she had to go dark, so she did. Here we see her on the job in 1940 when her work was under wraps. For many decades, the exact nature of her wartime work remained secret. It was known that in 1941, she created communication systems for Wild Bill Donovan's COI, which became the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. I've been able to prove that one system involved a one-time pad a method that properly used is unbreakable. So she was working at the forefront of her field. 
The rest of her duties, however, besides this work for the spy system, has been a mystery for a long time. But thanks to recently declassified documents, we now know exactly what she was up to. She was the lead cryptanalyst in the unit that monitored clandestine radio communications in the Americas. Clandestine radio communications is another way of talking about spy talk. And that's what she was doing. She was tracking Nazi spies primarily in South America. One of her chief targets was this man, Johannes Siegfried Becker, codenamed Sago. We tend to overlook South America in our histories of World War II, but at the time it was a real headache for the Allies. Not only was it rich in Nazi sympathizers, it was also rich in exactly the kind of resources the Nazis needed. If the Nazis could establish air bases in South America, they could leapfrog their way up to the Panama Canal Zone and seize control of it. And at that point, it was feared their bombers would soon be in range of the United States itself. To some, these fears seemed overblown, but the prospect horrified the Roosevelt administration. And Elizabeth's unit was seen as a key part of America's secret defenses. At first, most of the South American spies used low-grade ciphers for their radio broadcasts to the German handlers, and that made them easy targets for someone with Elizabeth's experience. Later in the war, however, the Germans gave important spies like Sargo a present. Enigma, the cipher machines that they believed were unbreakable. These machines were a type known as Abwehr Enigma. You can see one here. It was a medium security Enigma model that was easier to solve than the highest grade military ones. Like all Enigmas, however, it was no piece of cake. Armed with tips from British code breakers, the masters of Enigma, Elizabeth and her team tackled the messages, solved them with pen and paper, and recovered the machine wiring, which helped with the solution of further messages. It's worth noting that the same work, often on the same messages, was also being done in the UK also with pen and paper, and also largely by women. Yet Elizabeth's initiative impressed British officials. Some hoped to bring her to the UK's co-breaking center of Bletchley Park, but other officials panicked. The ability to break Enigma was Britain's most critical secret, essential to winning the war. That secret would be blown if Elizabeth's Enigma decrypts fell into the wrong hands. The wrong hands that the Brits were chiefly worried about were those of the FBI, and for good reason. Earlier in the war, J. Edgar Hoover and his G-men had often demanded Elizabeth's help with code breaking. In public, they then took credit for that work. And at crucial points, the FBI had shared her decrypts inappropriately, alerting the Nazis to her work and scattering the spies whose network she was secretly milking. With a record like that, no wonder the Brits feared the FBI would blow the Enigma secret wide open. Luckily, the top brass on the US side had already decided that her unit no longer had to give its secrets to Hoover. To Hoover. That new policy helped keep the Enigma secret safe. Later on, after the South American spy networks were finally broken up, in no small part due to Elizabeth's work, the FBI claimed the credit for breaking the codes. Papers all over the country covered the story and the FBI basked in unearned glory. Of course, it was really Elizabeth and her team who had done all that work, but they had been sworn to secrecy under the Espionage Act and they couldn't set the record straight. In 1944, the FBI also claimed credit for the code breaking in the Doll Woman spy case. This involved an American doll shop owner who wrote coded letters to her access handlers. It was Elizabeth who did most of the vital code breaking that allowed the spy to be convicted. But the FBI wasn't going to admit that. Again, Elizabeth was obliged by the Espionage Act and her own sense of honor to keep quiet about who had done the real work. She kept these wartime secrets all her life as she was required to do by that Espionage Act. And that's part of why she's not better known today. It's great to see Elizabeth at last getting credit for her war work, both what she did on her own and what she did as part of a team. You can see her here with one of those team members, Robert Gordon, who she trained from the ground up 
as she did the rest of the team. Yet even as we celebrate all she did in World War II, we shouldn't lose sight of how she herself felt about those years. For her, it was a time of frustration. In her view, she and her unit were not well deployed and their talents were often wasted. Why did she feel that way? It was exciting to work with Enigma, that certainly was true, but that was only a small part of her job. And she knew that this work was often being duplicated by British codebreakers. The rest of the South American spy material was rarely a challenge for her top-notch team. She always believed that her unit, as she put it, could have been better used on more important projects. What sort of important projects did she have in mind? My guess is she was thinking of Japanese Navy codes. After all, she had already shown remarkable aptitude for breaking complex Asian language codes in the 1930s when she cracked the Gordon Lim case. And she knew that Japanese Navy codes were of much greater strategic importance than the South American spy chatter. But Elizabeth did not have the power to direct how her unit was used. In fact, she was no longer even the unit's official leader. When the U.S. had entered the war, a male officer had been put in charge of the unit over her head, even though he had less code-breaking experience than she did. When she requested that her unit be given more challenging and more critical missions, she was stonewalled. After the spy rings in South America were broken up in early 1944, she spent most of the rest of the war monitoring low-level communications that had little strategic value. After the war, her boss, received six different honors and medals. Elizabeth received none. When the war ended, she recommended that her code-breaking unit be axed. It's clear from her papers that she was glad to move on. She then worked for the IMF for several years, creating their first secret communication systems. Then she retired. One of the most poignant aspects of Elizabeth's long career was that she and her husband were often required to keep secrets from each other. At the very start of their career, they both worked for Riverbank, but from 1922 onward, they served different masters. William worked for the Army, while Elizabeth worked for the Coast Guard and Navy at a time when the Army and Navy were fierce rivals. Military officials often suspected the freedmen of spilling secrets to each other. But as Elizabeth herself put it, the rule she and William lived by was just never, never say anything. It was impossible, of course, to hide everything. When Elizabeth saw what she called a certain grim look on William's mouth, she would know something had gone wrong. Likewise, she said, any expression on my face, he certainly could read. But they both did their best to forget what they saw. I tried to know as little as possible, Elizabeth later said. By the late 1930s, the stakes were so high that you just hoped and prayed you wouldn't have to know what you didn't want to know. This need for secrecy put a real strain on what was otherwise an extremely happy marriage. And one of the worst times began in 1939 when William was in charge of breaking purple the Japanese diplomatic code, a seemingly impossible mission. Unable to sleep, he would go downstairs and pace back and forth for hour after hour. Elizabeth could hear him, but she knew she couldn't ask what the problem was, and he knew he couldn't tell her. In 1940, Williamstein broke purple, but afterward he had a nervous breakdown. He ended up at Walter Reed on a ward with up to 20 other men who were also battling mental illness. There was only one psychiatrist for them all, Elizabeth remembered painfully. Patients were urged to confide in each other, but for William, burdened as he was with military secrets, that treatment was wildly inappropriate. At Walter Reed, however, little else was available. After 11 long weeks, he was released. He told he had an anxiety reaction due to overwork. And perhaps that was correct as far as it went, but it was not the end of the story. Later in life, he would be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which had no effective treatments at the time. In 1941, when he came home from Walter Reed, it was left to William and Elizabeth to simply find their own way through. It's a testament to them both that they did so. William never tackled such high-level code-breaking again, but he was back at his desk in three months. He later became a top NSA advisor, where he brokered some of the most critical intelligence agreements 
of the post-war era. His successes, however, were punctuated by periods of despair. During these low points, Elizabeth supported him, just as he had supported her during her own early times of despair. Still deeply in love, they had always seen themselves as a team, each upholding the other. To them both, that was simply part of what love was for. If William's breakdowns marked the lowest points of their lives, one of the highlights was a cryptology project they pursued in retirement. After years of working separately and in secret, they joined forces to study the problem that had brought them together, Shakespeare and Cyprus. They, they wrote together a remarkable book that proved once and for all that there were no ciphers in the first folio. The book was a great success, winning them international acclaim. Here they are at one of their bookstore events. By this point, the Friedmans had been married for 40 years. They had been code breakers for even longer, but they were still deeply in love with each other and with cryptology, and they were looking forward to writing more books together. Sadly, they had bargained without the NSA, which was unnerved by the book publicity that William was getting. NSA wanted its employees to keep a low profile, and by low, they meant invisible. So the NSA started clamping down on William. At one point, the agency went so far as to raid the Freedmen's personal library, a move that neither of them ever forgave. Elizabeth was outraged by the way the NSA treated her husband. She also feared that the agency would never allow the full truth of his achievements to be made public. After his death in 1969, she devoted herself to ensuring that the record was set straight insofar as the Espionage Act allowed. She cataloged their library. She helped ensure his papers were preserved. She gave interviews. She didn't pay nearly as much attention to preserving her own story, but she did make sure that her papers were saved too. These papers are now held at the Marshall Library in Lexington, Virginia, in 22 gray archival boxes. Box 21 holds this gem, the diary she kept in her 20s. Biographers like me are thankful that these papers still exist and that they're in good hands. We're also grateful for all the government files that have been declassified and for all of the photos that she and her family saved. These photos include this gem from the 1950s, taken around the time that William retired in 1955. Recently, the Marshall Library has discovered still more photos which are being cataloged now. We can only hope that even more buried treasure comes to light over the years because it's thanks to this wealth of records that we are coming to understand more and more about Elizabeth Smith Friedman's hidden life and to appreciate the full scope of her staggering achievements. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I'm going to turn things back over to Laura, who is going to help us with the question and answer period. And I do look forward to getting to your questions. Oh, Amy, I'm going to go ahead and give us a round of applause. I know it's always so hard, but it's so quiet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's stop sharing your screen. All right. Oh, there we go. All right, everybody. So we do have a lot of questions coming in, but I'm going to be a little greedy this evening and I'm gonna ask my question first. Um, so Amy, I uh, just, just was enamored by your book and really enjoyed it, especially the episode of the American Experience. Like I love that show. So it's just so enamored with this story. And I wanted to ask you about um, the, uh, Friedman's grave. So the Friedman's are buried in Arlington National Cemetery, and there is something very special about their headstone. And could you share a little bit about that story with us? Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, there are plans in Elizabeth's papers where you can see Williams, uh, what they plan to have chiseled on his headstone, he died in 1969. She would live for another 11 years. 
And if you look at some of the design, I suspect he had a hand in it. He was a very good draftsman and I recognize um, some of his work in it, but Elizabeth decided to take it one step further. Um, there is his favorite saying on the stone and it says, knowledge is power. There was his name, there was a space so that her name could be added later and then knowledge is power. Um, if you take a close look at that knowledge is power, um, I won't give it all away um, right now, um, but it is a cipher. Um, it is the perfect memorial for Codebreaker. She spoke with his colleagues and with her children, but it was absolutely Elizabeth who was behind that. I went to Arlington National Cemetery, partly just to pay my respects. So I spent years working with this and uh, I, it's not always the case that the more you research and write about someone, the more you admire them, but it was the case for me um, with both of them. And uh, they're on uh, the southwestern very edge. I mean, they're, they're right at the very, very last. You have to walk quite a distance to get there. Um, but yes, I, I could see that and I could work out the cipher for myself. And I have taken photographs so you can see it in the book. Um, if you want to have some idea, but even there, you know, you, you can work out more of that for yourself. To go there and try and solve their cipher myself and try not to spoil it. Um, so I have so many questions coming in, everybody. I'm going to try and do my best, but some of the guests were, um, while we were on the subject of their passing, was curious about what Elizabeth did in that 10-year um, period between William's passing and her passing. What was she up to? Well, that is the period where she was really working on their papers. They had made a decision earlier about what to do with everything they had. They had thought at one point, maybe they would start their own museum because they collected so much. They, they had one of the best libraries in the country on cryptology and they had saved a lot of machines and a great deal of that was William because he just loved the history of this, but she also played her part in that. and had saved her own papers too. Uh, they made the decision um, not to give them to the Library of Congress because Elizabeth had been working in there and was really shocked by the condition of papers that she was looking at. They offered them to the Marshall Library instead in part because they were huge admirers of General Marshall. And the one condition was that they had to organize them all and create an index. And he was quite ill in his last years. It took a long time to do that. So she was continuing to do the work afterward. Um, and then she did many interviews with them and uh, they've done a wonderful job putting even the audio tapes of some of these. If you want to hear how she sounded, you could do that. She did interviews with the BBC. Um, at first, uh, people were really asking her about William's career, but you can see as time goes on that people are saying, and what did you do? And being so fascinated by the answers. And so we're very lucky to have those interviews. And uh, there were some that were um, classified interviews at the time that the NSA did that have since been released as well. Um, so yes, a lot of what she was doing was trying to preserve his legacy, um, but in the process, she did save her own. She paid less attention to it, um, but we're so lucky that she did that. Otherwise it could have all been lost. Right. And so many secrets are still hidden in there that you were uncovering. And I thank you for ask, answering another question with that answer. Some of our guests were curious about why that location for their papers. And that's just so great to know. Um, some guests are curious about their children and what became of them. Yes, their children, uh, they had a daughter who was born in 1923, Barbara. And in 1926, their son, John Ramsey, was born. Um, Barbara did a number of things. She was a very bright woman. She ended up, um, she went to Radcliffe at the time when it was Harvard, Radcliffe. She um, then served during World War II at the um, Office of the Censor in Panama. Um, she worked for a while, I think, at the, um, maybe in the uh, National Institutes of Health. Later on, she would help with labor organizing out in California um, in the 1960s. So she had a very, very career. Um, their son, John, um, one of the things that I found in the book and, and when I was going through papers was that he 
was very young when he was taken to one of Elizabeth's uh, first radio interviews. Uh, she did one, I think, in 1934. Um, so, so he was quite young. He was just eight years old, not quite eight. Mm -hmm. And um, he got taken into the production room. And I think that might have been the moment where John just met his future because he ended up in production um, for uh, television by that time. And, you know, at the 34, that wasn't possible, but he worked with the production of, of videos first, uh, partly in uh, just educational things. Uh, he later wrote a script about his parents' lives, um, which never got produced, but really? that was his area. I know, I know, so. Oh, it's wonderful to hear from them too. So when, um, when the children were growing up, where was Elizabeth able to stay with them? Because she was, was she like breaking ciphers during the day and then going home and taking care of the house at night and the family? This is one of the things I was very interested in, you know, as a working mother myself was how did she pull this off? Uh, and, you know, that, that her husband felt very strongly that she was entitled to have her own career, to use her, her own abilities, um, which was not the rule at the time, but, you know, how do you make that work? Part of it was that they had help. They had housekeepers, kind of a changing roster over the years. Um, and so they had, at times they had live in help. Um, and they were absolutely clear that, that this was essential. They um, really uh, were very close to many of them. And they, Nevertheless, it wasn't, you know, sort of all left to them, but there were times where they would both be called away on duty. So someone needed to be there providing, you know, the continuity. Um, but they did, I mean, we have letters where um, William is writing to Elizabeth and saying, I hear from Barbara that you're giving her a lot of homework help. Cut it out. She's old <laughs> enough at 15 to do it on her own score. And if she can't make the grade, well, then she'll have to figure it out. But you should not be exhausting yourself. So we know she did a lot. And we know he did too. We know um, he told stories about Henry the whale at night. He would make them up. Then he read Sherlock Holmes to them, took them to ice skating lessons. So they were um, uh, very modern in the sense that they both were doing a lot at home. Right, very modern family for the time. I have yes. a couple of questions. I guess we're curious about Elizabeth's time uh, working in England. And um, some of us are wanting to know if she had any connection to Bletchley Park um, or if she had ever um, met Alan Turning. And so they're very curious about this time of her life. Yes, yes. Well, there is a letter where um, there's something um, that was a, a kind of unofficial. British wing of intelligence and that employed Ian Fleming and Rodal and it 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 was not uh, kind of the main channels but they got to know Elizabeth and they could see her abilities and they recommended to the actual heads of intelligence back in Britain that we should be using this unit and I think their idea was that they wanted her to work on Enigma because they wanted to send her to Bletchley which was the center for Enigma and um, that didn't get taken up in part, they said, because they realized that they couldn't send her, that it was her boss who would expect to go. But if her boss wasn't a great code breaker, she was. So they just could see right there. Um, her unit got taken over by the Navy during um, World War II and the Navy would not allow a woman or a civilian to direct a unit. And so that's why an officer was put in over her head. And so, yeah, so that is why she never made it to Bletchley. Her husband did. Um, she never met Alan Turing again. Her husband did. Um, the work that she was doing was different from his. He was working on military grade. Um, Alan Turing was working on military grade Enigma. She was working on something quite different. Um, she was working on something that was possible to solve by pen and paper, whereas military Enigma sometimes was, but a lot of it needed the machines and the bonds, whereas she rarely used machines. It was mostly pen and paper. So fascinating to just the stark differences in their experience and their equalness and their intelligence and their ability to break codes. It's so fascinating. Well, 
Yes, it's so important. I think one of the things people get into is, you know, how do we rank them? And uh, I think it is true that in terms of the, the way that you think of, about these, that William Friedman was the closest thing America had to a Turing, in part because they both worked with cipher machines and they, they did like thinking very analytically about things. And Elizabeth worked a bit differently. She was more intuitive. Um, she was especially good at code because codes, you can't simply break down into the numbers. You've, you've got to make these leaps. And um, she was just remarkable at that. And part of what's important to remember about code breaking is even now, even in this day, it needs many different kinds of intelligence. The, the agencies that work with this, they need people who work with languages, they need the mathematicians, they need people with a very strong um, visual sense too. Um, they often um, recruit neurodiverse um, employees because they need many different kinds of intelligence brought to bear on this. And that was true back then too. Oh, I love that part of the story too. And I think it's a really great takeaway, especially for our students um, and our teachers. Um, it takes so many different types of thinkers to solve a problem as big, especially as code breaking and during times of war. I'm so great. And I had one of our um, guests, not necessarily a question, but I think it's just such a great testament to the Friedmans, uh, particularly William, um, who was, he was a soldier with Army Security Agency. I want to thank him for his service so much. But he mentioned that while they were learning, Mr. Friedman is mentioned in their book. So just the wide reach of this, of his and her, just her knowledge and her experience being passed on through generations, how wide reaching that is. Oh, great. All right. I did say uh, one, I do have a couple of guests who were just so excited to hear about Fabian Villa. They had, were not familiar with Fabian Villa. Um, the location is now called Fabian Villa. Again, it is not far from Cantini Park. So if you were in the Chicagoland area and you've been to Cantini, head over to Fabian Villa. I'm going to give them a big shout out this evening. Please check their website for information. I do not work there. I do not know their hours. Please check in advance if you want to go visit there. But um, the grounds are absolutely beautiful. And I do believe last time I was there, they had an exhibit about the code breakers that were there and especially during World War I exhibits inside of their outside of the home. So I highly suggest that. And to roll on that, some of our guests were curious if there were any other historic sites they can go to in like their Elizabeth Smith Friedman pilgrimages, road trips this summer. Uh -huh. Well, one of the things I would like to say about Fabian Villa, if you go to that site, there's a windmill there. It's one of the things that people will remember if they're there. There's a Dutch windmill. That was where William Friedman had his genetics experiments. That's what he had originally been hired to do. And when they married, that's where they first lived. So when you, when you go and you see that, uh, that's the honeymoon home of William and Elizabeth Friedman. In terms of other places, actually, it's one of those things that uh, you really see how fast this time has disappeared. It was such a crucial time, but William did most of his work in the munitions building that has disappeared. And most people would say that's a good thing because it was a terrible eyesore in Washington, DC. Um, and, even you know many of the places uh, where they were um, have just gone, but there are some lovely moments in Elizabeth's letters where she talks about, um, for instance, at the the very last days of the war in that um, summer of 1945, where she writes about the places that they went to, and they see Guy Lombardo. They have three days off, their first three days off in years during the war. Um, and they, you know, paint the town red with, you know, going out dancing at night. And um, one of the things she writes to her daughter in Panama is about seeing the lights coming back on, seeing the lights for the monument and seeing that for the Lincoln Memorial. And so I think about that when I'm there. And as I said, you can go to see in Arlington National Cemetery, you can find where and the grave is, and it, it really, you know, I find it very moving there. Um, but also there is this wonderful site grave that's hidden there. And um, if you're looking for their grave site in advance, I highly suggest heading over to Arlington National Cemetery's website. They have a 
wonderful resources available to help you plan out where those locations are. Miss Amy, I want to thank you so much. We are going to start wrapping up this evening because I want to honor our end time of seven o'clock. So I am so sorry if I did not get to your question this evening. Um, if anything is just in the middle of the night, you wake up, feel free to send me an email. I'll do my best to get those questions answered for you. Um, but again, I want to thank everybody so much for choosing to spend their evening with us today, especially on the St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you who are celebrating today. Um, and I hope that everybody will be able to join us in April for our, our next date with history. Again, that's called Danger Forward, the Forgotten Wars of General Paul F. Foreman. You can register for that at firstdivisionmuseum.org. Amy, thank you again. Thank you for burning the midnight oils for us tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, everybody. And we will see you again in April. Thank you again, Amy. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good night, everybody.